hey, did, is that did the, did the bay shrink? Like, is it is it lower than it was? You know, after a rain, she'd be like, "You're losing your mind. Like, you got to <laughs> fix that. Whatever's going on." I was like, "No," because it literally was. It was eroding, um, and so I lost about four or five inches on one corner. That d- took a ton of rain. What's up, everybody? And uh, we are coming to you today from the old podcast studio. I got Mark here, Ruben across the table, and Josh Freilich is yes, back. Sir. You were on actually uh, quite some time ago. You were on one of our earlier episodes as well, talking about like, oh man, all kinds of cool stuff with shotguns, competition, yep. open division shooting, all the red dots, all that stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also just introduced Josh to the double rainbow guy. Yeah, I'd never heard of the double rainbow guy before today, so um, mind blown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just like his mind. <laughs> Everybody was, was blown. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there we go. Yeah, here's a perfect chance to use our new sound effects board, too. So. Oh, wait, actually, hold on. No, well, that would have been great for okay. also, but that would have been good. That would have been. I always feel like that's like I a feel negative like the mind one, blown though. was the explosion one that. Oh, God, we're using them all. Better. Better. <laughs> we got a few left. There aren't going to be any left. That's no, the we only a, time you're going to use that. We one. got a few left on tap to maybe uh, surprise you guys with. But uh, Josh, one thing, you know, big thing that we want to talk to you about today, though, was um, if anybody followed us at, at the main Vortex Optics page on Instagram, you did a really cool Instagram story takeover. You've been posting stuff on your own page for those of you who follow Josh. If you don't, check him out. Uh, it's just at Josh Freilich, right? With yeah. Like a dot in the middle, I think. Yeah, underscore. Okay, underscore. All right. Yep. Um, on Instagram, you've been posting about this as well. Um, it's it's really you built your own gun range, and uh, mm-hmm. or or I know we were discussing this even a little bit before like the technicalities of did you do every single thing maybe not there was a few yeah. things you hired out whatever but we'll, we'll yeah. get into all that but basically i mean it's in your yard yeah which is pretty legit i think it's something that everybody dreams of doing someday is just like being able to walk out your door and have your gun on you and be like okay what well, you know let's go shoot today out to uh you've got you've got yourself a full-on bay for bay style shooting and you have a little bit of long range stuff which goes out to how far 550 550 yeah every i mean incredible every, everybody's got their own gun range at least one time yeah <laughs> right I, you yeah, got one shot <laughs> Technically, yeah, yeah. So yep, I have a gun range that I can shoot at and not get in trouble. How's that? Exactly. Good distinction. Yeah, yeah. Important. Uh, okay, that's yes. that's a fair point. Yes, this yeah. is this is one that uh, he can use repeatedly <laughs> without any issues. Um, I'm uh, I'm not going to be in tomorrow. I, uh, I I use my gun range. <laughs> I use my one. <laughs> um, so yeah, we want to talk to you about that because there's there's all kinds of things. You know, I think I think everybody, like I said, maybe dreams of having this sort of uh, this just so easily accessible range. Uh, one you don't have to drive to. All of a sudden, you know, when, when you have a range that you got to drive to, I mean, it's awesome. Having a local gun range or whatever that you can get to is a great thing, and it's yep. something that uh, that you know we all should hopefully have somewhere nearby or, or the ability to shoot. Um, but yeah, I mean, it adds so much flexibility. You can have more time shooting when you have something like this. You don't end up having driven. 35 minutes, you get there, and, oh, I forgot something. And then yeah. you got to go back, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just really it's really neat. And you obviously have the means of doing so with the property that you live on. So there's, mm-hmm. there's a little bit of, um, you know, differentiating factor between you and somebody who lives in the city. Obviously, I don't really think they're probably going to be able to set up a shooting range. Even yeah. though I have seen on YouTube, there's, like, a few people that have some quasi shooting range ish things in town. And okay. I know they often are frequently the, um, I think they're, they get in a lot of fights with their neighbors. Like I said, everybody's got it one time. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, but, but we'll get into that. We'll get in, we'll have to get into everything. Maybe you can give the listeners though, who aren't aware of this, a little bit of a rundown on your range so we can get yeah. kind of, we'll, we'll put it out there and then we'll, start asking questions and talking about the details. Yep. Yep. So I think, uh, first and foremost, I didn't always have the farm, right? I didn't always have a place that I could build this range on. And so, um, much like most people that are into guns, into shooting, that kind of thing, 
I dreamed about this for years, right? Uh, I shoot a lot. I shoot, you know, five, six days a week. And so I was always driving to the range, half hour both ways, half hour setup when I got there, uh, shoot, and then I'm away from the family for two, three hours, five or six days a week, plus, you know, after going to work and stuff like that. And so it wasn't a sustainable endeavor to shoot as much as I shoot and not have a range. So uh, our first step was we bought 10 acres uh, over in uh, kind of on the outskirts of town where it was just outside of city limits. I could technically shoot there, sure, um, but it wasn't like a big range, something like that. I could hang some targets and, and shoot and not get in trouble. I could shoot more than once and not get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that was one thing. But again, I still had uh, suburbia coming in around us. So we lived at that home for seven years, and I did learn to shoot at that property. I did uh, do a lot of shooting at that property, but they changed city ordinances to mess with me, stuff like that. I had to shoot less and less as time went on. Were there, like, complaints being filed or something? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I got to know the sheriffs and the sheriff's deputies. because they were super cool guys. Oh, that's good. Yeah, they'd swing out and be like, what are you shooting today? I'm like, wow. Rifles, you know, you guys are here. Everybody heard me shooting. So, you know, <laughs> if it was pistols and shotguns, I usually kind of fly under the radar, especially if it was like a nine millimeter carbine. Oh, sure. You know, I sure. get less complaints those days. But if I get the 223 out or something like that with a big break on it, suburbia is, you know, on the east and west of my property, I'm blowing lots and lots of noise out that way. And then there was a, like a, environmental lake behind the property, which was part of the reason that I had a safe direction to shoot. Okay. Well, the echo over the lake shooting a rifle, uh, you know, I was, uh, at one point I was like, I had my brother over. I was like, I got to see what this is like. So I went out to the other side of the lake just to hear him ripping a little bit on, on an AR. And I was like, Oh, okay. That, <laughs> <laughs> like, I get it. Okay. You know, and I always did my shooting at like five thirty. you know, and people are out in their yard because sure. I, you know, I was done with work then too. And so, um, I did get it. And I people are it. looking at their calendars like, is it the fourth again? Yeah. Like, like, just, so yeah. like these ordinance ordinances, like they weren't, you know, suburbia moved in and just natural rules were like, they were because of you. Yeah. No, the, <laughs> the city administrator and the mayor of the town that I lived in stopped by my front door and let me know that they were going to be having a council meeting in regards to my shooting. And that was like <laughs> the topic of the Man, council you meeting. you were that guy. Yeah, I was that guy. Wow. And, and so, but they were, again, they were cool guys. They had, you know, no issues um, other than, you know, their constituents, uh, the, the members of the community, more, sure. than, more than me, this one guy had a concern. And so, again, I got it. I'm a reasonable person, right? And so I went to that meeting and I negotiated with basically the rest of the city that uh, instead of being able to shoot every day from 7, uh, 9 a.m. till 7 p.m., it was, they wanted one day a week. I wanted three days a week. We settled on two days a week. Okay. Call them a so, bunch of commies. I did not. I didn't have that's to go there. Good oh, point. Wait, I thought that, I thought <laughs> that's that how it. you win people over, Ruben. That is how you win people uh, over. I mean, I thought it, but yeah. I think that's Dirty how you commies. won people over back in the, uh, what was that, like the late 70s or so? That's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But anyway, so two days a week, I shot there. That was the last two years. And then... Uh, new developments started going up even more. And I was like, this is, this isn't, this isn't going to work long term." And not only that, but I was the guy that people didn't like in the neighborhood. Right. Sure. So like I have little girls that, you know, are going to the school next to the neighbor that their parents don't like us. And yeah. I'm like, let's just move to a place where, uh, we have, you know, space where other people are doing some shooting. And at the very least, like we'll take all the steps we can to be as responsible as possible and have, um, this thing built so that there's, if there are people that don't like it, it's only a few versus mm-hmm. thousands that could technically hear us at the old place. You well, know? nobody sure. wants so. to fit. God, nobody likes me. That doesn't yeah. feel good. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Right. Well, and I don't, I'm okay with it, but the kids, I'm like, oh, I don't want my little girls growing up no. in a place where like, hey, oh yeah, yeah, you're the, you're the family. My parents said your dad's crazy and yeah. he's probably going to go on a <laughs> shooting spree somewhere. So, you know, it's like, yeah, next yeah. thing you know, yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. And, and at the same time, too, as much as as much as much we are all about, you know, oh, you know, you're, you're free to do something like this, yada, yada. It's at the same time, though, you know, and, and you want to get mad at people who are coming over and saying, oh, well, we're going to have this city meeting or something like that. It's like, well, I mean, they, they don't want to go into their job and every day have people calling yep. them up, just phone call after phone call, yep. like, there's somebody shooting again, you know, and... and it just yeah. yeah so i got it you know in uh, while i was within my right at that property to yeah. do shooting 
I, I got it. And so we, we spent about five years putting all of our pennies away and looking for property for about 18 months, looking for the right spot. I looked everywhere throughout Wisconsin. I looked at South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, I looked at all these places with a couple of, you know, for me, it was, I needed to be within a couple hours of the airport. Um, and, uh, I needed a good, you know, area for the kids to grow up. You know, that stuff was important. And then I also just needed a community of decent people that didn't mind that stuff, a little bit of shooting and a local sheriff's department that understood what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that I wasn't, you know, I mean, I wasn't causing a bunch of trouble out there. Right. I, I'm just, uh, an American person that pays their taxes, works hard and, uh, likes to shoot firearms, you know, a lot. Like, and so, um, I had my what work kind of person, I like him already yeah. had my work cut out for me though. You should put bids out and have towns <laughs> bid on having you move in. Uh, the, yeah. Add so. some America to your town. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. That was it. So, uh, it took us a while. I mean, I, I came, I was already, uh, looking at properties that were maybe an hour from here. Right. That was, that would have been four hours East of my place. And so we, we took a lot of different places pretty seriously. We went out and visited uh, four different places. And then there were like two or three others that were really good candidates, but either the sheriff was like, you're going to do what? Nah, I mean, you shouldn't do that here. And I'm like, okay, no. I mean, like, that's what I wanted to know on the, on the front end. Like, oh yeah, they have a right to an opinion. I mean, whether it's in within the law or not, I asked for their opinion. I didn't ask what the law was in right. the area. I'm going, how do you think this would go over in your community? Cause I do want to know. Like, I, I, I want to know that because I don't want to be that guy. Well, yeah, you don't want to yeah. be in the same pickle no, you, you were before, you know. Yeah, after putting in a ton of time and resources into trying to find the right spot. Yep. And, yeah, at that point, it's not a matter of, like, well, am I just going to sit here and try and convince everybody in this area, including the sheriff, that what I'm doing is okay? Or do I just find yep. a spot where it's like, you know, I have to do that? Yep, because a lot of them were cool. A lot of them were like, you're going to do what? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to shoot a lot. And they're like, oh, okay, no big deal. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to shoot a lot. Like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. We all shoot a lot. It's like, no, I'm going to shoot a case of ammo a day for the rest of my life. <laughs> Is that going to be a problem, right? And, like, you'd get, the, they'd freeze for a second. It'd be silence. They'd be like, oh, no, yeah, that's fine. Uh, as long as it's safe, you know. You hear All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey uh, <laughs> Betty, can you go online and Google how many, how many rounds in a case? <laughs> yeah. Wait, how many? Oh, oh. Oh yeah, that'll it, that'll do. It sounds yeah. like it might be at least thirty, which I know is a yeah. pretty dangerous number. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yes, oh, Bring box, back. Right? I have a box of ammo right here. It's got twenty rounds in it. Yeah, you should be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there there were a lot of steps that went in before we even started the range planning. Before we did any of that stuff, I just I wanted to make sure I was in a place that was long term sustainable. You know, um, mm. and it wasn't like one day we go, okay, well, let's do this thing. I mean, we literally saved again all our pennies for like five years to be able to put a down payment on a property that's still kind of a stretch. You know, like we just, we took a little bit of a leap of faith, but it was like, hey, this is what I do. Um, let's do it right. And, and mm -hmm. you know, so that was on the front end before we ever moved dirt, we ever hung a target, any of that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, and I think, you know, like, for example, I remember when we posted the, uh, I think it was a blog article that we that we uh, highlighted of kind of this project that you mm -hmm. did. And it's funny because you occasionally see the comment of somebody who's like, well, it would be super nice, but I don't have, like, you know, that many acres. And I just think to myself, like, cool, then you don't expect to build a range in your backyard, yeah. you know? and. It's like some people will look at, you know, uh, of, of course, anything you say these days is like politicized. But let's say you look at, uh, with no politics involved, you know, some professional sports player, right? And it's like, well, it'd sure be nice to be able to squat 600 pounds and be, you know, whatever, like super professional ball player. And it's yeah. like, I think it is nice. That person probably put a lot of work into doing yeah. it. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't want to, just don't expect to be a pro ball player. You know? you so it's like, um, yeah, I think when people see this kind of thing it's like well if you know you want to do the whole diy range thing like think about all this stuff that's going to go into it and you know all the yeah. saving and all the research and stuff you've done yeah. well and i mean you made it a priority right like yeah. you yeah. that was your priority to to get a piece of land like that somebody else might you know buy a hundred thousand dollar bass boat because they like to the bass fish right yeah. you know Have you read so the talent code that book the talent code i haven't uh -huh. it's a cool book it talks it's it's written about like uh elite like performers and elite athletes but it focuses a lot on like olympiads and world champions um <clears throat> and people like uh 
poker phenoms, like kids who are like 12 years old. And basically this guy found out through a ton of research that the average like elite athlete at a world level, like stage performance level, puts about 10,000 hours in to get there. So it's like for anybody who is listening that doesn't know exactly what Josh does, it's like looking at gearing up to win the next worlds in whatever that it takes a lot of reps yeah it's mm-hmm. like your life yeah yeah, yeah it is you and ever read the book being okay with being okay <laughs> no it's <laughs> <laughs> good one i'm all right uh, yeah is that actually a book <laughs> it's the mark boardman story <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, you might before this airs you might want to if that's not a book already you might want to trademark <laughs> that trade, title that's well, it Ruben trademarked a, like a business earlier oh, yeah. or something I like that. No, if, so. if it's recorded, it's If you just trademarked. say it on a podcast. Yes. There you go. I might write that signed, one down. Signed, sealed, delivered. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, is, that is true, though. So we didn't, I didn't do a vacation for six years. We don't have other hobbies. Like, uh, you know, we'd go visit grandma and grandpa, right? Like, costs are down. Like, pennies are saved. Like, uh, you know, the... It's real. It's real easy. Like you say, the athlete. You look at the athlete, and you go, "Ah, it must be nice, right?" Mm-hmm. It's like, well, God, you know, the, underneath, there's so much grind that happens to yeah. make cool things happen, no matter what. And yeah. So, um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of that. I I wanted to throw that out there because just because you know I'm thinking to myself, you know, if we have a podcast, it's like how to build your own range, you got 550 yards and a shooting bay. Some people are going to be like, "Whoa, well, I, like, I'm not going to be able to do this." Like, well, you know, anyway, yeah. there's there's this little bit of aspect of you know yeah. got to grind for, it, like you said. But anyway, yeah. um, one of the things that I found just really neat is that a lot of us go to ranges mm-hmm. and you go to a range and everything's it's already there and you don't really necessarily fathom how much work went into making the range yeah. a range yeah and so you had to go through that individually you didn't just sort of show up to something that somebody had already done you started out with the blank canvas which i just think is so cool and and all of us i think as shooters should be able to appreciate what goes into making a range because not only do I think it makes you appreciate having a range available to you if you do have one, you know, I think it makes you a bit, a little bit better steward to your range too about keeping it sure. tidy, trying not to, you know, yep. demolish anything or ruin anything or whatever. Um, but it's just really neat too. Again, it, it, we get into the fact sometimes, sometimes knowing things isn't necessarily for a practical applications. It's just because you think it's cool. Yeah. And I think it's really oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. Some of the stuff when you were talking about, you know, building your shooting bay and doing the berms and, you know, little tricks you found for, you know, like getting used tires as backstops in your long range, um, section and, uh, just even the direction that you're going to be shooting and what your backstop is and what's beyond it. And yep. that's all, I have to imagine that going through that, even with how much shooting you've done in all the ranges you've shot at, you were probably, I have to imagine it was kind of like, oh, that's how you do that, or that's yeah. how that works, or yeah. I guess you can't, it's not that easy, you know, or whatever. Yeah, I learned so much through the process, and it made me appreciate the really good ranges that I get to travel to around the country. Uh, but it also made me a huge range critic too. Cause it, now I'm like, <laughs> like, why did you put that there? Like, Oh, you know, that, that range floor is so rough, you know, or whatever. Right. You know, like it, so both sides of it, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, the process really was, you know, in my mind it, for about a year, year and a half, as I knew this was coming, every time I'd go to a range, if I saw something I liked at the range, I'd talk to somebody at the range about why they did that or how they got that or where that came from or what material did they use for the range floor, any of that stuff. If I saw a a bay that was dry right after a huge rain, I'm going, why, why is that dry? Like, why isn't that holding water? You know, like trying Mm. to understand all the stuff that isn't always that nice, but you find a place where it is nice. And it's like, they did something special here. I can't really put my finger on it, but what is it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and you start to figure some of that stuff out that like a good range floor has got like a 3% grade. You're always running uphill just a little bit, but that way the water drains out of the bay. Like simple stuff that allows, it stops erosion from happening in the range. It allows you to stay, keep your feet dry. You know, like all that stuff, little little tiny details yeah. that make a big difference. Dude, That's so- interesting though. Like anytime you're like, if, <laughs> if you weren't going to build a range, those would probably be details that you might just gloss over. Yeah. Right? And it's yeah. like, you know, I'll bring it back to hunting gym like I like to do. But like- Just hunting. <clears throat> oh boy, here we go. Uh, <laughs> but like- Somebody might see a deer, right, and be like, oh, yeah, there's a deer. But, like, a person who hunts is going to break down 
okay, what kind of deer is it? How old is that deer? Why is it yep. standing there? What 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 are the plants that it's feeding on yeah, right now? The is there right water now? close? Is there not? What you know all the all the why stuff yeah. I guess like yeah. and so you had to answer all the why stuff and you go to a lot of ranges which I would think sounds like it's pretty beneficial to yeah to break those things down and really glean a lot from it. Yep, and I went to some ranges I'd never been to before just because I heard they were nice. Right. So like I'd travel maybe to a different match that I hadn't participated in before because I heard they had a cool range or some stuff like that. I did for some matches too mm-hmm. over that course of time, just so that I would get a little bit more exposure to things that were new. Yeah. You know, things I hadn't seen before. Learning about this stuff. I mean, you kind of had to learn, you had to learn a lot of like landscaping stuff basically yeah. and learning controlling water and all that is one thing that I always just think, you know, to me, I walk out and I look at our house and I go, oh, it's got a yard. You know, it's just grass. <laughs> like they they just put a house. They kind of they picked a spot where the land wasn't super hilly or anything. They just yeah. put a house there and then the rest of it was just how it was. And you're like, oh, no, you know, there's culverts that go around. And there's a grade away from the house. So the water yeah. gets away. And there's there's so much stuff with land that. Yeah, the way you you know you shape it, landscape it, you know, whatever. Yep. Uh, grading is it's such a wild thing when you actually see it in practice um, or have somebody break it down. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's so much work to change it. So like that's the other part where I was like, you know, I just got to move this over there. Like that's easy. You know, when I was putting up the backstops for the long range, it's like that's not tough. But I don't have any equipment, right? You know, so I spent. Literally, like, uh, I did, I don't know, 1,600, 1,700 five-gallon pails of dirt that I shoveled off the back side of this. Like, I had them put this big, like, 20-foot by 20-foot pile of dirt off the side of the back of the berm so that I could use that around the property when I needed fill and some of that stuff and use it for long-range back steps. So that's what I filled those tires with. And I just had a trailer on the back of the four-wheeler that I'd just fill with five-gallon pails and, you know, I'm like, oh, this is probably a couple hundred pails. You know, you don't realize some of that stuff, but it was like every day. I thought your arms looked a little bit bigger than yeah. the last time we saw you. <laughs> <laughs> Shoveling buckets of dirt. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, there, it was a lot of that stuff. It was just like no end in sight. You start the job and it's like, whoa. Like, right. you know, I, fit, I finished what? You know, like it took me a weekend to get the first, you know, target backstop up. How many targets? I have a 31 target array planned. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in really big trouble here. Like yeah. this is, or, and, and so at a certain point after a couple of days, I was like, well, no, this isn't a weekend project anymore. This is every day. Uh, you know, I need to find an hour a day to just knock this out. And uh, so it was just, you know, kind of projects like that, that were um, either I buy a $60,000 Bobcat, which I couldn't afford because I'd already spent all my money on on the house and all that stuff. Those are cool. Yeah, they are cool. They're fun. I rented one for one day. <laughs> yeah. I broke something on it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you didn't have an app. You could just go on and rent something yeah. from somebody. <laughs> That'd be handy. Gosh, it would be a good idea. Somebody should think of that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so lots of manual labor, lot, lots of hard work or big checks if you want to move this to this spot, like around the property, dirt and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. just, you're either paying somebody a big check to bring bulldozers and backhoes and all that stuff in, or uh, you have equipment and you do it yourself, or you, you can literally do that stuff by hand though, if you're committed. Yeah. 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 yeah I, uh, I was reading an article once on a uh, wall that was built in Ireland uh, and somebody who's a, you know, big Ireland buff, or maybe people in Ireland listening, We'll know what this one is. It's like across this gigantic hill, and it was back in the potato famine, maybe era or something like that, when people were out of jobs and people weren't doing that well, and they had to come up with like something for people to do in order to like employ them, essentially. Okay. And they just had them build a wall out of stone, and they just pick stones up out of the ground and carry them up the hill, stack them, go back down, grab another one, and that's like what all the people did. The wall does nothing; it's for no reason. <laughs> like it doesn't divide anything. But like, if it, it, to the point of doing things by hand, you can do yeah. it. I mean, people have done it for a long time. But yeah, that's a little bit off topic. But uh, <laughs> we got to keep these people busy for a long time. <laughs> build a giant wall. Great idea. We're gonna uh, build a wall. Um, <laughs> anyway, it seemed like you'd be burning a lot of calories during a famine. I'm, everybody came out of that super ripped. Um, and that's <laughs> when the arm wrestling tournament started. So, uh, <laughs> but. Regarding the, so you mentioned like a 31 target bay and your long range setup, and we've talked about this, this bay style where you have berms all the way around. We should, we should probably talk about like, can you break down 
how your range is set up, like some of the cool features about it that sure. you really like, yep. just what what things you have going on there. Yep, yep. So I wanted to, um, you know, everything is, uh, you got to deal with the space you have. And so I wanted, originally I was like, I want like 100 by 100 bay, 100 yard, 100 by 100 yard. Wasn't realistic for the property that I had, unless I wanted to sacrifice tons of my wildlife management space because that that's a dual oh, yeah, multi-use right. use property. Oh, there too. Oh, big time. And so- I mean, it's the farm that we live on, it's the range, and I want a wildlife management preserve, if you will, a place to hunt that's like my little slice of, of heaven. And so I, I, I dedicated this like 15 acre chunk that was, this is the range and anything above and beyond the range I get out of this chunk, awesome. And so hundred by hundred didn't fit. Okay. So there were some sacrifices along the way that just, I, I had to take. And so I ended up doing a 25 yard by 25 yard square in the middle. That's what I had surveyed. And that was going to be the inside diameter of the base of these giant dirt, dirt hills. Right. Okay. Um, and so that way, if I'm standing in the back corner on one side, I could shoot across the other corner and I can do a 50 yard shot. Mm. So okay. that was, that was what I was looking for. And so I'm, I'm technically back outside of the bay a little bit when I'm taking that 50 yard shot, but I have it available inside the bay so that I can shoot a full 180, 190, 200 degrees inside of that bay safely with nice backstops. Like that was the goal for that spot. Dirt mounds are 17 feet tall. I got that from like the NRA best practices for range building. And then I talked to some other organizations uh, that built uh, their public ranges And they were like, hey, you know, really you do want to follow like an NRA best practice for range building because if there's ever a round that leaves the range that wasn't yours or something like that, and you can go, I followed this rule, I followed this rule, I followed this rule. Um, Like you can show that you took every step possible and did all the things. Like all of a sudden now it's like, well, liability goes down. Right. um, Because you've you've done all the things that were suggested of you. So – you know, while I didn't think 17 feet was necessary for me to practice out there, if I have a buddy out or something, I want to make sure that I've checked all those boxes. So sure. built 17 foot berms and it's just a nice square with the back of it open. Mm-hmm. And then we found a spot within the property. We talked a little bit about trying not to annoy the neighbors as much as possible. Well, I, I picked a spot inside of a fenced in pasture that had big oak trees kind of all around it. And I left the big oak trees up. So we surveyed it. I had the excavating company in that brought the back uh, hoe and the, the bulldozer in to build the initial mound. And like we made sure we saved as many of these big trees that would be like uh, noise catching trees when they're, you know, full leaves and stuff like that. Because um, I'm just trying to keep as much of that noise in the bay as possible. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah I that think that sense. insulates that sound quite a bit. Yep. Yep, it does, especially when I'm doing the majority of my training. You know, I train a little bit all year long, but like when you start talking about April, May, June, July, August, I'm hitting it hard. I'm out there every single day, really working hard, ramping up because that's when seasons happen. And, you know, I've got three major matches in July here, Mm -hmm. right? So, like, if I'm home, I'm shooting that day a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, that's when the leaves are all on the trees and they're catching as much of that noise as possible. So um, we tried to take advantage of all of those natural features of the property too, Mm -hmm. and then pointed in a safe direction. So I do most of my shooting from the back of the bay straight into the nose of the bay, not all of it, but much of it. And so beyond the, the bay, I wanted to make sure there was a nice, safe, lots of wildlife behind it, not, a little community sitting on the other side of it. Sure. You know, yeah. just keep it as safe as possible. And then what's your, uh, what's the floor of it? Yeah. So I used, um, my favorite floor of any range floor is, uh, an asphalt mix with class five. So you get just a little bit of tar ground up in the class five gravel. And what that does is that tar in the heat and when it gets pressure on it, it kind of hardens just a little bit, uh, without being like a basketball court. So, um, Pure class five, uh, it gets dusty after a couple of years. Oh, yeah. And so when you're running, there's just these dust clouds behind you. But if you mix class five in there to some, ex- or uh, tar in there, um, asphalt grounds, then uh, you get a lot less of that dust. That's so, cool. Yeah. So on the ranges that I saw uh, around the world, that was like my favorite of all of them. And it was actually not crazy money. Mm. It wasn't too bad. So Nice. Yeah. 
And then I remember seeing that you said you learned to, uh, when you put those berms up, yep. these big impressive mounds of dirt. Yep. And the rain started taking them down, <laughs> basically. I was crying. Like, I was literally, my wife goes, you've got to do that. you got to do something to fix that. Because I'd be standing on the second floor of the house looking out the bedroom window. I'd be like, hey, did, is that, did the, did the bay shrink? Like, is it, is it lower than it was? You know, after a rain, she'd be like, you're losing your mind. Like you got to <laughs> fix that. Whatever's going on. I was like, no, cause it literally was, it was eroding. Um, and so I lost about four or five inches on one corner that d- took a ton of rain. Yeah. Well, I can't, I mean, the work that you've put into it, I mean, that's like demoralizing, like yeah. I, you'd be panicking. <laughs> like you, you know exactly oh, how many buckets of dirt yeah. that was hauled by hand. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, it's like even the, I picked some uh, blackberries the other day and like, man, it takes a lot of blackberries to get a little nice little bucket of blackberries. And by God, I made sure I ate every damn one of those. Yeah, things, if you'd spill you that know? thing on the way back to the car. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd be devastating. Oh, yeah. In fact, I, there was some, <laughs> it was kind of a steep hill and I was in my flip flops, of course. Uh, and uh, I was in a couple of precarious positions positions where I almost did dump that and I was like, oh man, that would just, that would suck. Like, yeah. I, you'd just go home. If somebody yeah. did dump blackberries, it would be you though. Probably. I'm just saying. Where's the <laughs> lie? That's a Mark thing. Good chance of that. Where's the lie? Uh, uh, not that that really has anything to do. Kind of has to do. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I can see where your your level of stress would probably be through yeah, the roof. It was really bad. It was really bad. And so um, I looked at all the options for that. That was like, surprise, this is going to cost money, but you got to do it. Because all this time, all this energy, all the money invested was literally washing away with the rain. Right? And it was just... Ugh. So I had... A bunch of crews out and then got a bunch more advice from people that have actually done it before. So like they were going, and half the crews were like, hey, we got to hydro seed this. And I was like, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, okay. Um, and then I'd talk to some people and they're like, okay, what if it rains the day after the hydro seed? You have nothing. I was like, oh, well, that was four grand if I hydro seed. And I'd have nothing if the rain poured and drained it all. What is hydro seed? They just spray on that green over the top of the dirt like you'll see in the ditches sometimes. Uh, and oh, okay. from that, the, it, it's got seed in it for grass. Yeah. Well, so it's it's really vulnerable, though, if, if you get a big rain that just kind of washes it away. And okay. so um, the only, like, foolproof way to do it was this, like, erosion blanket. Mm-hmm. It's like this straw mixed with, like, mm-hmm. fishing net. And the guy's like, well, you know, the, the right way to do it, you, you probably don't want to do it. And I'm like, no, seriously, I'll tell me the right way to do it because I'm already just going nuts. So he's like, well, the right way to do it is you got to run this erosion blanket over the top. You can't run it sideways. You get, you got to. I'm like, okay, tell me exactly what it is and what the price is. And he's like, well, I can just drop it off. I was like, no, you got to do it and then like guarantee the work because I'm so stressed right now <laughs> that my range is disappearing. I was like, bring it out. So anyway, we we put the erosion blanket on it and they seeded uh, with a natural Minnesota vegetation. Like just some, uh, they called it like a pollinator blend hmm. that they threw underneath it. So it's going to have wildflowers and a bunch of other stuff. So it'll, it'll look beautiful when it's all done. And then they mixed it with like an oat cover crop. So uh, oats to just come in and put some root system down. And then they put that underneath uh, all this erosion blanket, staked it all down. And then I went through and I put another like a uh, 50 pound bag of uh, cover crop oats over the top of it the day before it rained, uh, like a week later. And now I've got this beautiful vegetation coming out of the top. Every time I look over out of the window now, I'm like, yes, that looks so nice. It's, <laughs> yes, it's still there. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like a berm slash food plot. It really is. Yeah, it would absolutely be good, a good food plot. So there you go. Problem solved. Mm. Check and check. Dual mm-hmm. purpose. <laughs> I like that. I did a lot of dual purpose. So uh, from the long range, we had a timber company come in, right? And they'd cut me this 550-yard lane, another 300-yard lane. Uh, and uh, we had uh, this pulverizing connection that's put on the front of a bobcat, and they go through and they like grind the stumps. Oh, we're looking at that, that the other stuff. day. Oh, was it one of those oh, yeah. fecon things? I don't know what it was called. Forestry but it has, mulcher. Forestry. Yeah, yeah, it's oh. crazy. Oh, you watch this, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I love those YouTube videos. Yes. Pretty, pretty cool. Very satisfying. Equipment. Yes. Extremely. You also, see forest, mm. and then you see like this beautiful patch of ground oh, yeah. mulch behind it. Keep talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Say more. Uh, so we, we did that. And then uh, now, uh, as uh, late August, we're putting uh, clover and alfalfa blend 
in that uh, in that lane because it's going to have limited sunlight with the closed canopy forest all the way around it. And so I was like, well, what's going to grow really well in there that's also going to stay low and not right. cover my targets? And so it's like a nice clover blend will be really, really solid in there. And now I've got um, an acre and a half and an acre food plot right in the middle of my shooting lanes. Like, how sweet is that? Oh, I've got a six-inch target at 400 yards, and I know how what my rifle dope is on that. And then, you know, Bambi comes out at 400 yards. It's like, well, I know how to hit you. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> That dope's already there. Yeah, you already know. Yeah. So yeah how was how, how was your shooting session? Huh? I got one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. My so October's pretty, cool. pretty open. <laughs> 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 Just FYI. FYI. Yeah. yeah. So it, a lot of this stuff ended up playing out that way, where I was like, well, you know, not only could we make it a cool range, but let's do stuff that's good for the habitat and a cool range all at one time. Do you find that, um, like, shooting, and maybe it actually ends up being better, but, like, the amount of shooting that you're doing has an impact on whether wildlife sticks around or not? Yeah, yeah, they could care less. Care so, less. Yeah, so one of the neighbors, when I moved in, he's like, you're not going to shoot during hunting season. I go, Todd, I go, hey, listen, man, the amount of shooting I'm going to do over the course of the year, you'll be able to shoot a deer, and the other ones will just look at it like, what the hell are you It's doing? probably better. Yeah, they, they yeah. I mean, that's how my old property was. We had 10 acres a little pinch point with a highway in front of the house and that little uh, environmental lake behind it. So like they would have to come through this pinch point unless they wanted to go on the highway. And so a buddy of mine and I would sit back to back in there and it was intensive harvest in the twin cities. You could shoot unlimited doe and one buck each and we'd get three, four, five deer on opening weekend, just sitting there and you just shoot a, shoot a deer and another one would just come walking in. Cause you, you, They'd be so desensitized right. to, to shooting guns that they didn't even care. It didn't spook them. That'd be at least three weeks of deer meat for you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I always bring the, I always I always bring it up. This is like the hundredth time I brought it up. I've just never seen. I love to eat deer meat, and I've never seen somebody consume an entire deer in like two weeks. That was very impressive, Jim. Oh, it was really exciting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was also it's also a little depressing. <laughs> It is sad when you when you run out. It is. Yeah. It is, especially so quickly. Yeah. And then my wife was like, thank God, finally. <laughs> it wasn't that she didn't like it. It was just that she was a little bit concerned that we had the same thing for dinner every, every uh, night for yeah. two weeks. I but like, anyway. But not you, sidetrack, but oh. I like I manage all year like which cuts I use and that's then, like, impressive. Oh man. I'm do you like, have a plan? I possess that ability. Like you budget? I, uh, I have like I have like shelves. I got one of those vertical freezers. Yeah, that I use for all the venison, and so I I'll do like the one I shoot first on the bottom and separate it into like yep. different cuts. Yeah, and then the next one and then the next yep. one and like now I'm on the top shelf right now, which is the the newest deer, and it's like a half a shelf left, but yeah. it's an equal portion of burger, equal portion okay. of steaks, Jeez, roast. That's organized. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do that. And then no, what I you do, yeah. this is the secret, you put a thing on the freezer, like a little whiteboard, and then you check it off every time you take something so you know exactly what you have. Wow. What? You've seen my desk. That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> it works really well, though. Okay. I, I like, I I like the mystery. It. Put the inventory on there. At the beginning, like when you fill the freezer, the mystery is fun. I like, no, eh. it's not. No, how about how no? About, but how about I, when you're? I disagree. You're rooting around. And you're like, "Where's the pizza rolls? I swear I left them here." And you lift up a some bag of sweet potato fries, and there's there's a piece of backstrap you forgot. That's a good. That's a su- nice surprise. It's like fun, it's a, but it's I can't a great live surprise. my whole life like that. That's the twenty dollar bill <laughs> no, you found in a like, pair of pants that you haven't yeah, worn. Well, in two your years. analogy is basically saying you live off of twenty dollar bills you found in the parking lot. Mm. I'm not not saying <laughs> that. <laughs> My analogy is like it's nice to find one once in a while, but I got to be more organized uh, for the rest of the year. All right. That's a nice surprise until you pull it up and you go backstrap. And you're like 1976. You know, <laughs> like that's why it's there's so a, light. There's a balance there. <laughs> well, if it's at there, the bottom of the freezer, dried. it's colder at the bottom of the freezer than it is at the top, and so Jim. we're borderline cryogenic. Jim, Jim, Jim. There. Okay. So anyway, um, back to the range. Let me ask this question. I know I would assume it. Well, there's probably two sides to it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little horse sound effect for you. What did you hit? 
<laughs> I didn't even notice. That's not good. I'm in there. desensitized. Um, <laughs> do you love the fact that you have it to yourself? Like you don't have to contend with other people. Like you know, a break going off in your ear. Um, but or do you hmm. miss the camaraderie of going to the range? Oh, I have to go to the range. I still do. You still do. And, and when I, uh, I probably at least a couple times a month, I have people out to train with. Um, oh, okay. Because oh. the last thing I want to do is get in my own little world where I define success by something that's not measurable against you know uh, whatever. I, I want. I try to bring the best shooters out that I can, and they run the training when they come out. I train myself all the time. Okay. And so like, I like to both have camaraderie with other shooters that are like-minded that are as hardcore about this passion as I am. And then at the same time, I want to learn from them. Like, why, why are they training this way? Or why, why are you setting the drill up that way? Or you know, stuff like that. And so I do that often. And then on the flip side, I bring as many new shooters into our space as I can with that, with that range. Uh, like for example, I've got a neighbor that's right on the road, uh, with us and he's been a hunter for his whole life. Um, but, uh, over the last like 90 days or so, he has to go downtown Minneapolis with some of his clients on a regular basis. And he's going, Hey, uh, would you, would you help me understand like the rules for carrying a gun? I was like, I would happily do that if you'll invest time to learn how to shoot the gun that you carry. Right. Okay. So if you're willing to do that, I'll teach you all the stuff. And he's like, well, yeah, that's fine. And I was like, well, okay, so come over to my house. We'll shoot, you know, all the pistols and you pick something that you like and I'll tell you where you can go find one and all that stuff. And so, like, I, I, I like to use the range for a couple of different things. That camaraderie is a big part of it. I enjoy mm -hmm. that. But I bring people in to help me get a different way of looking at things that are really high level. And then I'll bring brand new people into the space. And it gives me the opportunity to have control of the space when I do that mm -hmm. so that there's not, you know, some other Yahoo, you know, that's like, they're going, what is this? You know, we have the range to ourselves and I can have a controlled environment and bring new people into the space. Do you feel yeah, like it gives nice. you a better, better like name in the community too? Like I, I would feel the more people that get to use it and yeah. have a good experience, they're going to be defending you if yeah. something ever came up. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I like that a lot. Yeah. It's really, and because it is, it was built well and because it is safe, the backstops are there. Everything's like nicely done. I'm, I'm, I can bring people out there and their initial responses. It's like, wow, this is really neat. And they're just cool, excited to be part of mm -hmm. it, right? So the neighbors, every one of the neighbors within a half mile is shot at my range. That's cool. Right? Mm -hmm. Privately, we have got gates up and we've got stuff like that. But like they can send me a text and go, hey, are you around this week? And I'll go, absolutely. You, you know, what night works for you? And we'll spend a, I mean, they don't shoot like, like I shoot or we shoot. Like if they want to come shoot, they'll, they want to shoot like 40, 50 rounds and talk yeah. about guns a little bit, you know, like uh, come out. Yeah, it's fine. I'd yeah. have to imagine the best part about having your own range is basically the time savings. Yeah. It's pretty great. Like that would yep. be awesome. Oh yeah. yeah. Time. Oh, I mean, you have a little like, bit more patience. I, just, I don't want to make sound. Well, I'm just going to say it. You have a little bit more patience to deal with other people. Yeah. If you're not spending an hour of your day when you want to be shooting just in a car between the shooting range and, ha yep. and mm -hmm. home. Yep. So whenever I'm going somewhere, like if I have to go somewhere to play basketball, you know, it's like when I finally get there, I'm like, that's all I want to do. Like I, I don't have a hoop at home. Like yeah. just don't bug me. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to get out cause I have to go home. I got to go to the grocery I got a store. Hoop if you want one, whatever. Well, that's good. I never have used it. I appreciate that. You, you know, but then, but then, if that was just in my driveway, though, and somebody came up to me and talked to me, I'm just kind of like, "Oh, it's no big deal." I like, I, yeah. There, there, I have an hour of time that I otherwise well, would have been in the car. That I, I can would imagine you'll get more people involved because you have more time to dedicate to yourself that you're not driving. Yep. So you can bring more new people in too. Yeah. Well, and what a comfortable setting too. Like you're not in front of other people. You're with somebody who you know, who you trust, who yep. you, you know, you're not, yeah. you know, if you're worried about maybe embarrassing yourself or asking a question, it's like, no, like it's, it's, uh, yeah. you know, Jim, you love it. It's a safe space. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when have I ever said safe space on here? <laughs> <laughs> you, you hate, you hate the uh, term. You hate that term. And it's, but, it's set up too. Uh, I do too. In the Bay, I have uh, targets that I, I'll always have the new shooters work on. I never have them shoot paper. 
like I shoot paper a lot. Mm-hmm. It's part mm-hmm. of what competition shooting requires. So you can call your hit without anything telling you that you got your hit. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. But if you're a new shooter, that's not as much fun as shooting steel that just goes boom when you hit it. Yeah, so I have, no way. I have like uh, seven or eight of those targets in the bay that like uh, that's what we shoot when I have new shooters in. So they get instant feedback. They're just excited about the whole thing. And, yeah. And you, you bring someone into the community when you do that one time. You know, next I'm getting texts from them. What do you think of this? And it's like, oh, that's not the holster you need. But uh, we'll talk about it next time you come over. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll show you some options. You yeah, know, don't like, make any decisions today. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you ha- do you have more? I mean, obviously, it's your place. You can do what you want, right? But yeah. like, so as far as like flexibility to change things, like. And you guys don't go to way more ranges than I do, right? So I don't know sure. how much, I guess, control you have over, like, what's there or what you can change when you show up. Yep. Like, is that, do you have a, a, a lot greater amount of flexibility there to switch mm. things around? or? So I, I was a member and am a member of some really cool gun ranges, uh, like Force Lake Sportsman's Club right in Minnesota there. And uh, as a member, uh, we were able to set up whatever we wanted okay. with the props that were there. Uh, if we, you know, pass all the safety tests and everything, so we could use a certain gate that had give you that access. Okay. But to set up like a, uh, a complex shooting environment, you, you could be spending an hour, hour and a half. If you, especially if you're there by yourself, if you were to set up like a competition stage, if you wanted to go that far, it could take you two or three hours to oh, set wow. that up. Yeah. You're not even shooting. You're, you're just not even setting shooting. it up. Yeah. And then, you know, then you shoot for what, an hour. Now you got an hour to tear that thing down. And so like, you never do it, right? You, like, yeah, you never do it. And if you get two or three buddies that want to go shoot, maybe you do that. Um, Cause it, you know, a lot of people help and makes it shorter work. But like, yeah, absolutely. So what I do at, at the house is I basically set up something super generic with some walls and different targets. And then like uh, that works for lots of different drills. Okay. Uh, and I'll set that up. And then my plan is three, four, five times a year, I'll just spend a Saturday morning, three, four hours, and I'll redesign, I'll have a plan and I'll redesign how I've got the layout in the bay. With and like walls and with stuff. With walls and barrels and yep. all that kind of stuff. And then I'll just go out there and, and execute that. But from a simple target or flexibility perspective, yeah. So like every night I've got a process, like I go close the gate to my kids, put the chickens away. Like we've got all this stuff that's like on our nightly checklist that we just do. Well, I already know what my training is going to look like the next day. And so I'll go and I'll, I, I shoot like waterproof paper targets. And so like, I'll go hang my targets for the next day or uh, I'll set up the steel that I want to shoot the next day during that oh, time. So you can just get up and do it. Yeah. Cause then like I'm on conference calls, you know, a majority of the day. And so I'll have all my mags loaded while I'm on mute on, uh, <laughs> on those conference calls. And then uh, all I've got to do literally, uh, usually it's over my lunch break now is I, I just grab the mags I loaded and I run out to the range and my drills and all that stuff's already set up. And I'm in and out of there in, you know, 30 minutes, uh, 35 minutes. And I'm back in the house, have my lunch, and I'm back doing my thing. And just, you know, it just becomes part of the day. It, it, back loading mags at work. Back loading mags. Yeah. Dual purpose. Yes. 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 Getting it done. That's so. pretty slick. Yeah. How, um, regarding, like, the uh, the steel and obstacles that you have set up there, yeah. like, what – I got to imagine – I haven't been to nearly as many ranges as you guys have, but I've been to a few, and every single one of them has a million different obstacles. I mean, you go down to Triple C, there's a the hull of a helicopter. You know, there's vehicles, <laughs> there's yeah. barrels, there's things that look like rooftops, there's whatever. Yep. Y- you could fill up your entire property, I'm sure, with yep. props. How did you narrow it down? Like, what props do you have, and how did you narrow it down to the props that you ended up putting in there yeah. so that it wasn't just like... Oh wait, I can't I can't go anywhere now because there's just props everywhere. Yeah, so I tried to pick the most common stuff that I saw and the most difficult stuff that I saw. Okay, so um, I've you know VTAC barricade is a super common prop. You know, it's just this like half sheet of plywood that's got some holes cut in it. That oh yeah, create difficult angles that you've got to run a rifle in and stuff like that. So I had a couple of those built. Uh, again, it it required like a sheet of plywood and uh, measuring tape, right? I mean, and a, a bucket of paint because I painted everything black. And so, like, super easy. I've got one on the competition bay and one over on long range that I've got. Then 
more difficult target presentations, uh, like rooftops at different angles, those rooftop uh, props yeah. can be really tough. You've got to understand the angle uh, to build a good position to get stable, depending on how tall of the or long, big the mag is that you've got in the gun when you're shooting off of it, all that stuff. And so historically, the only time I've ever shot off those props is at a major match at a championship level event. That's where I'm learning to shoot off of these things. And I'm going, well, that's dumb. So I made an investment and had one of those built. That's really nice that I can adjust the angle on, mm. do some stuff like that. So, And that was built simply because I've had trouble with it at competition matches because I've never been able to really train on it. So I'm like, well, I got to have one. Yeah. Um, a wobbly bridge, which is just a, a structure that uh, either has a platform on it that hangs on wires or chains. And I went with chains. And so like... Basically, it's an elevated platform that as you move or as you shoot, the recoil will move you uh, on this platform. So you sure. lay on it. The whole platform moves. Again, every time I've shot off of it, it was at a major match or a championship event. And I'm going, you know, I'm not even really sure I'm doing this right um, and, or if there's a better way to do this, perhaps. And I've learned drastically different approach to shooting off of those two different props because I have them now. Yeah. You know, and then some easy stuff. So like we see these giant wire spools at almost every place that we go and those you can get free. So I like, I, I got three of those uh, brought out to the place and I can roll those around or use them oh, as sure. tables and do whatever. And I use those as rifle props and stuff too. Explain getting stuff like that for free. You got, I mean, how many yeah. things, how many things in your range did you get either for free or for a surprisingly low cost? Like, Spare tires, I know you talk yeah. about stuff like that. Yeah, so um, spare tires, uh, a lot of the wood was uh, from construction site. My brother's a construction guy. So oh, after dark? Yeah. <laughs> no, odd lengths, <laughs> odd lengths, yeah. uh, chop pipe. stuff, stuff they're going to throw away. Uh, you know, so just whatever, right? Like you can, you can pick that stuff up and it's no big deal. The spools, wire companies are always trying to get rid of some of that kind right. of stuff. Hmm. And so like... When I was looking around trying to figure that stuff out, I initially was starting to figure out, look for what the, what those things cost. And then by talking with the community, the, the firearms and competition shooting community, people were like, hey, don't pay for that. Why, why would you pay for that? Like, here, you know, this is where you can find that kind of stuff. That's like, super oh, cool. Oh, sweet. You just call up like, oh, like 1-800 wire company and they're like, oh, yeah. We yeah got- if there's an electrical company or like a... a yeah, not necessarily low voltage, but like uh, a legit electrical company, they'll have those giant spools. Uh, they'll they'll probably have them out on the road uh, or in the in their parking lot. And if you drop in there and you go, hey, what are you doing with those? Like they'll let you have them. L- likely let you have them. They fit in the back of a. Tra- I'm trying to think of how big they are. They're big. Um, you'll need a trailer. Okay. L- likely, but um, a lot yeah. like barrels. Yeah. Well, so barrels. Uh, I. For me, I, I ended up paying for them just because uh, everything on the range is black at my place. I just wanted a clean look, a yeah. clean background. I do lots of content there at the range. And so all the banners are black, all of the walls are black, all the barrels are black. So because I couldn't find free black barrels, yep. I just ordered them, you know. Well, and Nothing wrong yeah. with one to make stuff look nice. But where would you find, like, uh, free barrels if you didn't care how they looked? Yeah, so um, I don't know about free on that. And but like or cheap you, ones, yeah. Craigslist or something, you could probably find them for 10 I think we 20 got, bucks. I think we got mm-hmm. them for uh Winnequa, our local action shooting range here. I think we got them free from a place that makes like butter and cheese and oh, popcorn sure. and oh, stuff like that. Yep. Oh, yep. I Some think we got Wisconsin like a hundred of them, nice, yeah. But I think like uh, that stuff's all over the place now, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I wonder if like a brewery would have those too, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm making stuff up at that point. But what I would tell you is any of that kind of stuff that you know that is used in the manufacturing process but then ends up being waste, you can call the company. You can just go, hey, what do you do with that stuff? If there's like legit chemicals in there, they might go, well, we can't give it to you. be a liability. liability. Mm -hmm. But if it's like cheese or if it's like dye or something like that, that's no big deal. Like you get a deal on it or they'd give it to you because they probably have to pay to get rid of it. Like the tires. Yeah, there's usually a, yeah. a environmental fee. Yeah. Yeah. Like those tires from the tire shop for the backstops on long range. Like I just called the different tire shops or that were around me and I was like, hey, I need like 200 tires. Um, <laughs> you know, and everyone was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> we're okay. having a party. Yeah. I was like, no, no, no. no. Like, <laughs> we're we're going to burn a bunch Big of tires. Big fire. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, basically I got to pick which one was willing to deliver. 
you know, because they literally delivered them to my farm. Amazing. Uh, for free. Oh, man. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, I-, I want something for free and I want you to deliver it to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably better than yeah. paying off so twenty five bucks a bargain. tire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that it, worked out. There yeah. is there is some stuff like unrelated to that a little bit, but I know some of what the uh, car guys will do is when they want to um, when they want to get rid of have like a big oil uh, thing to hold oil. Yeah, spent motor oil. They'll actually find in some real old homes that had oil burning furnaces. Sure. Yeah. And when they want to convert them to a different style furnace, the, the HVAC guys will go in and they get these big old cast iron things that would hold all the oil. And there's nothing they can do with them. They end up having to throw them out and they end up at some dump leaking oil everywhere. Yeah. Or a lot of mechanics will buy them up and then they just like blast them and paint them. And then that's what they use as their re- receptacle for all the spent motor oil. And it huh. works. Huh. But yeah, I mean, you know, you look into stuff like that too, even if it's yep. if it's something like, oh, they used to build houses this way or they used to build buildings this way and when they upgrade them, they got to do something with all that old crap. Hmm. Yeah, and some of it's cool because it's repurposed. You yeah. know what I mean? Like right. those those spools on the range, like they're kind of neat just because it, it wasn't really meant to be a thing on the range, but they're on every range. Yeah. So it's yeah. just kind of cool, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, there's something to that. What about uh, what about targets? I'm assuming the classics, uh, old TVs, appliances, glass <laughs> bottles. <laughs> no, none of that. The, the gravel pit specials, <laughs> pop cans. Uh, no, no. I, I just put in all AR500 steel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, put shootsteel.com targets in there. Good stuff that I can beat on. I've been shooting that stuff for years and years. And really, for me, it's important that um, one, I don't have trash all over, like that the gravel pit type. TV shooting. Oh, yeah. You bought an old farm, so I'm sure somewhere on the property. Oh, there's, there's like plenty. Yeah. <laughs> junk, right? Every farm has a few good junk piles. Washing yeah. machines, dryers, ovens, uh, micro- vacuum cleaners. Yeah, vacuum cleaners. Yeah, concrete blocks. Uh, yeah, you yeah, know, all the junk. Um, but yeah, so it, and then more than that, I wanted stuff that would be safe. I want to be very safe to shoot around. So, um, you know, most of the steel I have in the bay has uh, an angle to it, or when you shoot it, it has room to move backwards and accept some of that that shot from that lead projectile. So it hits it, it goes back, and then it p- pushes it straight down in the dirt versus hitting it and then splatting all over the place. Oh, okay. So mm. again, we're shooting, be, you know, seven yards sometimes uh, right up close, and I'm shooting 223 even, you know, n- not at seven yards, but close. And so for those, I have some short range rifle targets and. I just trying to make sure everything's as safe as possible mm-hmm. in there cuz you know the more you're around uh you know firearms and shooting and that kind of stuff you know if you're not safe the likelihood of getting some frag back from a target or something like that's probably pretty good if you're that's shooting not a too lot. comfy when that happens I know that happened to me once and yeah. I was like oh yeah I'm kind of close yeah. yeah or even sometimes when you don't think you're too close if right. the target's just not angled right 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 yeah, so trying to control as much of that stuff as possible, you know, just just ordering decent stuff so that I don't have to order it again to right? mm-hmm. the buy once, cry once kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, no, that totally makes sense. How do you build the? You've got uh, when I looked at pictures of your bay, you've got some of those walls and stuff. Is that just stuff you're building out of two by fours and plywood, or yeah, some of them are even they look like they're a little bit uh, transparent somehow, or so they're like yep. a netting or something. Snow fence, yeah. So it's just oh, okay. a snow oh. fence stapled on basically. With two by twos, so it's again super inexpensive to build. Um, you know, and again, it doesn't have to be even perfect lumber, right? Because who cares? Um, you know, it's just got to be, uh, in, you know, not going to fall apart. Mm-hmm. So as long as you can find some stuff that'll work, you know, two by twos, two by fours, any of that stuff, depending on how often you're going to move it. Um, you know, if you're going to move it a lot, the lighter the better. Yeah. If you're not going to move it around very much, you know, it almost doesn't matter how heavy it is. And well, you can use anything then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So now, like, you're pretty fresh into, relatively speaking, into this range. Mm-hmm. Um, and at this point in time, like, everything probably works, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I'm trying to think, what's your perceived maintenance schedule going to be? Is it... Do you feel like for the most part, all the hard stuff is done and, you know, berms and backstops and stuff like that, we should be good forever. I'm not going to have to worry about that anymore. Or, or is there stuff like you're still eventually going to have to bring in more dirt and gravel or, yeah, yeah. you know, what's going to wear out? So I think the, the dirt work's done, um, with the exception of potential damage because I kept the trees so close. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say I lose a big tree. 
Uh, I could lose a corner or an edge of that berm and have to rebuild part of it. That could happen. It probably will happen. You know, I'm just accepting that it might. Um, I think from a, from a range floor perspective, all that stuff, I'm pretty much where I need to be. And then I'd guess total maintenance and upkeep will be mostly, again, almost landscaping work, right? Because I'm going to have to uh, mow the berms to some extent to get them to reseed it this fall. And then you're going to want to do that every once in a while. What kind of mower are you going to use on that incline? I guess just you're just going to have to get one like that. Brush. Oric. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, but yeah, probably one of those handheld ones. Yeah, yeah. And then and you're going to come back and your arms are going to be even bigger. <laughs> again. And Hopefully. Just, yeah, you're no. just going to keep walking around just with these progressively <laughs> bigger and bigger arms. Uh, and then uh, the long range stuff, um, the sooner the better uh, that I get clover in there, the faster than the the like root sprouts and or the stump sprouts and all that stuff will stop coming up. I just hit it with, uh, well, I was, I was hitting the cornfields anyway. I put some corn food, corn field food plots in. Um, and, uh, so I had to hit those with this glyphosate to just kill the grass in between the rows and stuff like that. So we went down the shooting lanes and stuff, but we mixed it for corn. So it didn't do a whole lot to that, to that, uh, that regrowth that's happening in the shooting lanes. And so I've got targets that are covered right now. Yeah. You know, and so I'm going to need a brush hog on a tractor or something like that. And I'll probably have to hit that once a month, just normal maintenance to keep it down. Even when it is clover, I'll have to mow it so that I, you know, I'm not covering up all my targets. Yeah. yeah. And then the tires. So, uh, the tires, it, the bigger the stack of tires is the less stable that stack of tires is. Um, and so, I'm, I'm looking at some of my, like the 550 yard lane. I'm going, that might not be permanent. I've got a whole bunch of tires back there that are stacked up to about 12 feet. And some of them are already leaning and I'm going, okay, that's maybe a 12 or 24 month solution. And then at a certain point here, I'm going to run dump trucks down there once the ground freezes and put like legit 17 foot berm behind the 550 and the 330 yard Mm. long range lane just so that I've got permanent, again, if I'm the future, I'm going to have run some classes. I'm going to do some stuff like that out there. It's okay for me to shoot it. You know, I'm cool. As long as the target's covered and about two feet on each side of it, I know my rifle dope. Like if I'm missing, I'm right off the side of the target. So like, and there's nothing behind it anyway, but again, it's that liability coverage. I want to make sure I'm Mm -hmm. safe. If I have other people out there shooting though, and the stack of tires fell over or something like that, now we got a problem where I could fix that. I think long-term it's probably a permanent berm behind the cool the long range yeah that makes sense yeah but still happy i did the tire thing because it allowed me to extend the budget for this year even if it only gets me 24 months like that's more time to save pennies you know yeah. and do some mm-hmm. stuff so it yeah works. Absolutely. any future expansions in the future planned out all right so i got one more pipe dream uh, uh, yeah okay so well so i we did we did save enough to do some additional purchases so um I, uh, I, I plan on expanding. We bought a hundred acre property. Uh, I have an accepted purchase agreement that I put in place for another 40 that it connects to this. And then, uh, the guy that bought the, or I bought the house from, he has 60 on the other side of a pond that, uh, he wants to hold on to. He said for a few years, but he's almost 70. And so uh, he will sell me that piece of property when the time is right. And when I've already looked at Onyx and figured it all out. So the moment I get his 60, I'll be able to go to 1,100 yards. Uh, I'm across cu- the pond? Across the pond, yep. So I'm going to cut another shooting lane at this kind of weird angle that gets me to the back corner of that other 60. Yep. And that's when the 50s come out. I'm going to get, you know, big yes. ducks, <laughs> some, some big guns. Then. <laughs> so I'm pretty pumped. So like yeah. that, that's the 1100 yard move. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Current property, 550 was like, that was it. But um, I'd say by 2025, I think we'll be going to about 1100. That's pretty awesome. It sounds like you found a really good spot. Like, Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty neat. It, yeah. you know, it, it is everything we hoped to find. And more like, um, you know, I looked past this property for four months and my wife kept bringing me back to it. Cause she liked the house because mm-hmm. the, the guy that bought or built this house built his childhood home again. Okay. So he built it in 2000. So it's an old farmhouse with a wraparound porch. Oh, geez. That's what it looks like. 
two story, you know, traditional. But it's only twenty years old. But it's twenty years old, and so I kept oh, looking at. It and I was like, cool. "Honey, we're not gonna. I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want the old plumbing and old wiring. Like, I'm not handy. Like, I don't want to do that." And she kept coming back. She goes, "None of the other houses are this nice." Because we were looking at some dogs yeah. of houses. You look at a hundred acre property in our budget, and it was like. Some of them were rough, and mm. yeah. But once you once you finish uh, that burn with the dozer, bring it over here for yeah. the house. <laughs> yeah, for real. But this one was beautiful, and so she kept bringing me back to it. I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to live in this old house. And so finally, you know, we were looking at. It, I was like, okay, I'll look at it. So I looked at it. And I was like, two thousand. Is this thing twenty years old? So I called the lady. And we we bought the house the next day. You know, because right. everything else was right. Everything she kept going like, there's state land right here. I was like, well, yeah. How much? She's like. I don't know, 3,000 acres? I was like, oh, well, that's good. Like, I like that. She's like, there's no houses anywhere near it. I was like, wow, how do you mean? How close? I was like, oh, there's no houses anywhere around. I was like, wow, that, but it's old. You know, I kept making excuses because I, I just. You I didn't, didn't want her to be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, but yeah, so she found the, she found my dream range home and uh, wildlife management property, which nice. is go team. Yeah. yeah, that's wow. awesome, man. It do, it sounds like absolute perfection. It really does. Yeah, it's it's coming. It's it's a labor of love. I mean, we putts with it, you know, a couple hours a day, little stuff here and there. But um, it's super neat. I I have my coffee on the deck in the morning. We're glancing over at the the berms, and I'm I'm surprised today that this is real. You know, I I'm bet like, it reminds yeah. me of uh, in a Christmas story when the kid's dad gets that lamp, and oh, yeah. he just oh, it's <laughs> such a beautiful <laughs> lamp. <laughs> 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 it just is always uh, looking at it. Yep. Uh, uh, there's a man. lot of that happening. Yeah. <laughs> man, <laughs> I, I mean, I can picture that, though. Like, waking up every day, and you're like, oh, yeah, I Look live here. Those burns. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. 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 It's a it's double burn. Pretty cool. It's a double oh my burn. Gosh, yeah. What does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Man. But I, it, it, uh, it does seem seeing you do it, put it into, and I don't want to. I don't want to act like you're the first person ever to build their own range. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, I really love the way that you documented it, and it's helpful then that you're somebody who under, you know understands social media and the videoing thing and stuff like that and yep. photos, because um, you documented it really well. Uh, and so that's something you can go those listening, you can go and check out in the blog article that we did and stuff. Um, and it, it was. Uh, it was very cool to see, and I know it, it got me thinking, you know, maybe if it wasn't even on the same scale or something, but yep. it just seems so possible. It seems so, you know, mm-hmm. like... You were thinking, I'm going to build Ruben a range on my property. Um, I didn't... Ooh, I don't, I don't know where... Always, no, I misread that. <laughs> I Sorry. <laughs> Heart came in. <laughs> Uncomfortable but conversation. You, you mentioned that, and that that has happened. So I've, I, I have know of three people so far that have taking this leap, not to the same level. They built smaller things, but they've built places for themselves to shoot Yeah, based on just the, uh, just seeing that it could be done. And, um, so I've got one dude that he literally got like 400 tires, filled them with dirt and built like a little L in the back corner of his property before the weeds and him and his kids are shooting out there on weekends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got another guy that they literally, they already had bobcats and stuff. And he goes, we've got areas of the field that we normally plant and they produce almost nothing because they'll flood or oh, yeah. whatever. You know, just junk parts of the field. And he goes, we just took the bobcat and we just moved a bunch of dirt and we built something that now we've got really good backstops and we can shoot out to 200 yards. And I'm like, dude, that's awesome. And how, what did you spend on that? And he's like, well, gas. Right. You know, I mean, in time. And so, yeah. like, people are realizing that, you know, you can not only shoot uh, at home at some of these properties, you know, um, but you can actually build yourself something so that you can enjoy it more, mm-hmm. right? And you can do it safer, and uh, you can do it long-term without potential liability and consequences, stuff like that. So, like, pretty neat, pretty neat to see. I love getting stories or DMs on, on social where guys are going, hey, check this out. This is mm-hmm. what I built. Like, whoa, cool. That's yeah. awesome. When yeah. did you do that? Well, I did it like two weeks ago. I watched your story on Instagram or whatever. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. That is. Well, yeah. and like, I mean, you made like, that is a perfect example, like probably in a lot of places where you can build your own range, right? You're going to be a little bit more rural. Yep. And a lot of these folks, like you said, they might have or have access to some of the 
heavier equipment yep. to, to build a berm. And like I said, um, all of a sudden you've used a corner of the field that's not doing anything anyway. Yep. Oh, we, we were even talking about this a little bit because you were saying at one point you rented a bobcat. Yeah. And uh, Ruben that started his business. That Ruben started his business. What was it again? <laughs> R- rent anything? Uh, no, it's called Rent It TM. Rent It TM. Oh, with the TM on it, yeah. Is the TM <laughs> part of the name, or is the TM just a little TM like you see it's trademark at the end yeah, of Nintendo? Just... No, I know, but like, you know, it sounds like it's part of his name. Anyway, but... Uh, it's not. So you were saying is that not everybody might know that you can rent something like that. Oh, yeah, you can rent all kinds of equipment. You know, so, <laughs> so far since I've been at the farm, this is the stuff we've rented. Let's see. So I've rented uh, Brush Hog, like the, the walk behind. I thought that was yes. a cool thing to rent. And then I was like, well, that's not big enough. So I went back and I rented... Uh, like you don't f- have any fillings in your teeth, do you? <laughs> yeah, that, a couple. Oh, okay. And they're still there after yeah, yeah. using that? Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Uh, and then a uh, Bobcat, like a 590 Bobcat with a brush mower on the front. Um, that was super sweet. I ended up popping the hydraulic hose on that bad boy. I got it caught on a tree, but... It um, happens. Yeah, so I paid yeah. for that. But uh, rented that uh, trencher. That we oh, t- mm-hmm. we did toast the trencher. Uh, we've got a lot of rocks, so uh, you know uh, most of these rentals. I don't know if that's a winner. Are you not. allowed to yeah. go back to the rental place? <laughs> I paid. I had to pay. It's a uh, it's a great thing. <laughs> the great thing about renting is you break it, and you're like, uh, hey, sorry, I broke it. Here yeah, you go. Yeah, and yeah. Then yeah. They got to deal with. It. I mean, you pay for it you a little bit, but you didn't it. pay for no bobcats are like. I mean, brand crazy. New. Money. I can't even think of what they are. I know 50, seen, 60 grand. Yeah, you yeah, see yeah. used ones for like forty. You know, in any kind of decent shape. Yep, yep. So all of that kind of stuff uh, can be rented. Um, and so, you know, again, we, we've we extended ourselves to the point where I can't just go buy those pieces of equipment. No. But you can you can look around, and there's probably somewhere within a half hour you can rent something like that. Yeah. And, you know, um, just use it for the day. Just have a plan if you're going to do that stuff. Anytime you're doing any of this stuff, just have a plan. So right now on the whiteboard in the basement, I basically have, like, upcoming bobcat work that I have planned so that when I have what I consider to be like an yeah, eight hour day, that's, that's I'll go key. rent one again. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, Cause otherwise if you're just sitting on it forever and you're renting it for like two weeks, then and not know, using it the whole time. A ton. Yeah. 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 Or, or like, yeah, I do the same thing for some of my projects, like list out what you need to do for the day so yep. that you get it done in the minimum amount of hours and get that thing back. Yep. Yep. I've got the place near my place that they'll drop it off and pick it up. Um, the, the whole nine yards. So the, the equipment, any, whatever. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, I need it here at eight. And they're like, well, what time do you want it picked up? I'm like, well, I'll call you an hour before. And so like from the time that you call them and say it's done, you're done. And so like, you've got, I know I actually have like another 25 minutes after I call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so like, I've figured this out. So I'm like, okay, you know, Gamer. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So we get, we get it done. I uh, get, you know, when I rent a cat or something like that, um, I got to put deer stands up in like a couple of weeks. My buddy's building me these big box uh, deer yeah. stands. Oh, nice. We got to put those up. And so that's on the list. Like that's the day. But as soon as we're done hanging those bad boys, I got to leave the deer stand thing and go run and finish the rest of my stump move in and a bunch of other little projects. But yeah, you can rent all that gear. Let us know when you rent the Fecon. What's a Fecon? Just the big stuff. Yeah, the, the forestry yeah. mulcher. Forestry oh, yeah, mulcher. yeah. Yeah, those, the <laughs> rotary drum mulchers. Oh, yeah. When I you like watch videos of those things of those. all day. They're pretty neat. I'm going to oh. come over with a lawn chair. <laughs> so the problem <laughs> with... Watch the destruction. A lawn chair and a cooler full of beer and just... If I have to oh, run it, though... It destroy the stumps. <laughs> <laughs> Call oh, me if you're so going. it's so beautiful. What does this mean? <laughs> I want to watch Sorry, too. What were you saying? I'll clear cut the whole property. I can't run that, you know, because it's just fun. Yeah, those yeah. are neat. Yeah. I, I'll hire that one out. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have way more uh, open oh, timber one. than I planned. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the range part we're, we're pretty happy with now, and then the rest we're moving into. I've spent the last maybe thirty days spending most of my time for projects on uh, habitat management, mm-hmm. uh, working hard on that, trying to. This first year, the goal is to to start to develop a solid habitat, have a decent food source, decent bedding for the deer, stuff like that. And then uh, over this next winter, I'm going to do a bunch of like timber stand improvement, go through the the standing timber, open it up a little bit, get some of the junk out of there, and um, continue to turn the rest of that property into uh, really a haven for for deer and turkey and, and that kind of thing. So that's that's where a lot of the energy's moved. Like Finally, we got to the important stuff. <laughs> got some 
Got some do- big dogs on on the property on some cameras. Oh jeez, it's fun. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. That's, that, <laughs> that's the old. Uh, that's the old Mark Boardman drop everything. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. <laughs> Uh, no, that's been fun because again, at the old place, it was it was hardly hunting. You know, the, the, I, I've never yeah. like really had a place that I could do much with because the, the ten acres was an acre and a half up by the highway, seven acres of wetland or lowland, and then another acre back by the lake. So you had to like wear muck boots to get back to the stands, and we'd just you know there wasn't a place where you could put in a food source or dedicated bedding. It was literally just a transition area where mm-hmm. they come through, and so we never had an opportunity to like improve hunting. Um, we just got to take advantage of whatever the deer wanted to do at that property or at this place. It's like, I can literally take steps to keep them on the property more. Yeah. And you know, which, you know, that's the ultimate goal. Keep lots of deer uh, around so that you can help and control kind of what their movement is. Yeah. So cool. Right yeah. On. Yeah. It's fun. So cool. What a neat project. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, with that being said, like usually, I mean, people can, you were just talking about it. You get DMs and stuff on Instagram. So yeah. those of you who are listening to this, if you're curious about any other stuff that we didn't touch on here, definitely hit Josh up on yep. Instagram, uh, or whatever there and, and ask your questions. We'd love to see as well. Just like, uh, just like Josh likes seeing it. We'd love to see too, if anybody's out there DIY building their own ranges and stuff, that's, that's pretty cool. Oh yeah. We'll yeah. Have to check that out. So, uh, send that stuff on over to us too. Um, but otherwise, yeah, super cool. Thanks for coming on, Josh. Yeah, Appreciate it. By. It was really interesting to pick your brain. Yeah. Yeah. I had fun talking with you about it. Yeah. Well, All right. we'll see everybody uh, next time and thanks for listening. Bye. 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 See you. All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks everybody for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.